There we go. Um, and thank you, Norm. Thank you all for your patience. And particularly, uh, thank Martin Guerrero and his team for, you know, making me generally happy to be around. Um, just for today, um, my subject is exp ex sort of a, a little exercise I did a while ago. Um, I begin by assuming that a red giant destroys whatever is around, and typically that's a solar system or maybe even a small red dwarf. And the circumstellar material then assembles in the form of an excretion disk, as you might call, and the young white dwarf then irradiates that disk. And the radiation from the young white dwarf will tend to evaporate the disk. And I've tried to get a preliminary idea of the kind of flow patterns that this setup may produce. So let us consider what the initial conditions would be in such a flow pattern. Now, the kinetic energy flux is equated to the irradiation flux from the central star. That is totally straightforward. Um, and the launching of the flow is very simple. That is to say, it is perpendicular to the disk with a Mach number of order unity, and the outflow speed is then computed from the energy balance equation. And the inclination of the surface of the disk and the latitude as seen from the central star then basically determine the velocity with which the flow starts. Of course, then um, you also have to include the thermal energy, and finally, you end up with this particular equation that tells you the initial conditions. Now, of course, you need a disk to start with. And what I have done is I have concocted a very simple equation that is an approximation of a barotropic disk family. And over here, you see what happens to the launching velocity vectors for various shapes of disks, um, all the way between you know, practically toroidal um, and then back to disks that have a rather concave section. And, uh, at the conclusion of my talk, you will see the flow difference is quite characteristic of these two typical cases. Um, if you look at the difference from, you know, sort of this projection, you can see that you can expect quite a different kind of initial flow from a concave disk and from a disk that is rather fat. Um, here at the top, you can see what the irradiation would be from the, from the central star. So on the left, there's only a very narrow band, and on the right, when you have a concave disk, of course, it stretches all the way much further to the rim of the disk. So fat versus flat makes a lot of difference in the initial launching conditions. Now, um, the sim simulations I'm going to show to you are all cylindrically symmetric. Um, and let me begin by showing you my computational facilities. Um, as it happens, my university has decided that all computing equipment must be under the authority of people who have a research grant. And since I'm retired, I do not have such a grant, and therefore everything that I will show has been running on my 2015 MacBook Pro that you see in the foreground here. When having set up this disk shape, we have a few additional parameters that we can explore in this particular simple setup. Of course, the adiabatic index of the flow, uh, the Mach number of the initial flow, which is typically of the order unity. So let's assume it is one for these simulations for the moment. And then, of course, the luminosity of the central object. Now, the generic output will look something like this. I and mean, what I show here is an extreme example. Um, which, of course, I've concocted because we know from rocket engine exhaust and stuff what this would typically look like. Um, what I will show in the next few slides has a color coding. The red channel is the density, the green channel is the pressure, and the speed is the blue channel. And typically, you have a star over here, the evaporating surface over there, and everything is actually symmetric around the central axis. Um, this would typically give you an idea of how to compose an image like this. You have a gas density in the red channel, the pressure in the green channel, and the speed in the blue channel to give a composite of this type of situation. Now, a few sample solutions to begin with. Um, when you have medium luminosity, as you see in the top, you have a fairly turbulent and straightforward exhaust jet, you might almost call it. A large luminosity gives you an X shock in the, just above the disk, and a very small luminosity will give you a plume with, with a Mach number that is just a little bit above unity, but not very much. 
Well then, um, a conical surface gives a drastically different configuration from a concave surface. As you can see in the top, a conical surface where the, the, the inner shape of the disc is almost flat, gives you a sort of straight cylinder type outflow. And at the bottom, you get this characteristic X shock that is then superposed with this sort of bell shaped top with high velocity above it. There are many, many points in this kind of flow um, that you could list features that you can inspect and that, of course, in the fullness of time will be, have to be compared with observations. Um, just again, a few examples of the differences that you could expect here. If the shape of the disc in cross section is practically toroidal or conical or hollow or concave, you get very drastically different uh, configurations. Um, that is the main parameter, that the hollowness of the disc, as it were, I found is the main parameter that is responsible for the general overflow. Now, of course, ultimately, you would want to go to observables. Um, the various key parameters that I mentioned a moment ago have a, a relationship with one to another. The bottom one, in a sense, is the most important. But I want to point out that the launching velocity goes with the one third power of any of the other parameters that you want to put in. So there's a very weak dependence. In other words, you, you would find that a large range of luminosities, densities, and sizes will give approximately the same launching velocities. To give you an example, um, if you start with 100 solar luminosities, a Mach number of one, 100 AU is a characteristic size in the disk and the density of 10 to the minus 12 kilograms per cubic meter, your characteristic speed is going to be of the order of 20 or 30 kilometers a second or thereabouts. Um, from that same equation, this will give you an impression as to where you might go. Um, for instance, if you have a luminosity of, shall we say, 60 solar luminosities, you would typically expect a characteristic speed of 20 kilometers a second with the density that I've just shown to you. Bruce Ballack was nice enough to give me this image at the bottom over here, and at the top, I've just superimposed to give you some, some sort of idea of what this kind of flow might produce. Um, when you look at the bottom here from Bruce's diagram, you will see this so-called Hubble flow, as it were, where the velocity is linearly proportional to the distance. What I need to point out to you here is that this characteristic of self-similar flow. If you have self-similar flow, you have this particular thing at one time, and a moment later you have this, so you have this early, late, early, and late. You will see that the shape of that bell-type excretion part is more or less the same. And this would naturally lead to a velocity that is proportional to distance, never really mind what the situation is in the rest of the flow. Of course, the X shock over here then would be a completely different kettle of fish. Finally, to conclude, um, of course, we need to move ahead and uh, considering that we should not be modest about what we go when we want to compare things with observations, the very first thing we need to do is three dimensional hydro. As already mentioned, I've been running all of this on my MacBook Pro, but fortunately my junior colleague Simon Porter Hiswart had just recently given me access to his 64 core machine. And in the near future, I hope to redo all of this, but then for real and a little bit more seriously. The white dwarf gravity was not included. Um, that doesn't really matter very much. It's of course easy to put that into the equations of motion. And I do not really think that that is going to be very important. It's easy to compute uh, how much the acceleration there would be. And it is going to be very marginal. A different thing is the self-consistent disk evolution. I've just simply taken a surface from which I launched the flow. And that, of course, needs to be improved on. But even that means that the initial state, that is to say, the shape and the cross-section of the disk and the density distribution is still something that you have to specify. And ultimately, modeling of specific objects is, of course, going to be necessary. Again, I got this from Bruce. Uh, I'm just an off-the-cuff example that I concocted in maybe a few minutes. And let us compare this image of uh, NIS 3 1475 with a typical example of this concave disk flow. To begin with, you see that this conical inflow here will be monitored over there. And you have these various knots in the flow that were relatively easily uh, identified. Um, however, um, there are many, many, many generic features over here 
that you really need to take into account. The disc shape is conical sheath, the cylinder around the inner outflow, X shocks, and the refocused F shock on the outer side that may in fact be repeated a number of times, like it would be in a rocket exhaust. And as, uh, as Noam Soker correctly noted, similar shape does not necessarily mean that the model is correct. You really need to reproduce what people do at their telescopes. There again, there's a lot of computing to be done, but fortunately, there is a future ahead of this. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, so uh, Adam, you can ask your question. Uh, Vincent, that is beautiful work as usual and amazing that uh, you could do that. I mean, when you think about what it took 30 years ago uh, to run anything, that you can do that on your laptop is still a modern miracle. Um, <laughs> but uh, one question is, you know, cooling, cooling is likely to play an important role in these jets. Have you varied the adiabatic index to mock up cooling and what do you think would happen if you did? Um, I have run these things with a typical adiabatic index of 1.2, um, but of course I can lower that, all right, instead of 1.1. Um, one is sort of unstable, as you're probably aware. Um, cooling in the, the jet material itself, I have not taken into account. I mean, you, you would have to specify a complete energy equation for radiative cooling, and I haven't done that. Um, in principle, it's possible. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. My question is about the uh, precession. If if your disk is so large, you cannot have a precession over a time scale that we observe a few years. Say. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, to sort of, to be fair, right? Sort of this kind of stuff that I've shown over here. Let me choose a tree if I can. Put that back up. This right. I mean, we want to have the sort of S-shaped type stuff. Obviously, yeah. you need a way to wobble the, the central object, um, and I, I don't really know. Um, what I would guess is that if there is any talk on something as as fluffy and as big as this, it is going to be jolly difficult to to make a procession of this sort unless. Um, the launching was really done by the innermost part of the disk. Now that of course is possible. Let me check um, where we are here. Okay, in some cases, it's only the innermost part of the disk that does the launching. I think now that in a case like that, precession and wobbling of the disk is going to be much easier than if you really want to wobble the whole disk. Okay, any more questions? Okay, let's, thank you very much. Let's move to the next talk. The next talk is by, please and share your screen, uh, Vincent. Yep. The next talk is by Mohamed Akashi, who was my 